we are extremely lucky today to have um, Peter Frankopan, who is the rock star of history. He is the uh, what Mick Jagger was to uh, uh, to rock and roll in 1971. Is someone, uh, record, <laughs> is someone recording this, or transcribing it, or tweeting, or some, please, someone <laughs> preserve it for one when I when I when I'm no longer here. This is not entirely uh, just um, uh, letting off steam here. Uh, Peter's book has sold hundreds of thousands of copies uh, in fantastic uh, sort of juggernaut fulls out of WH Smith where it's been book of the month and uh, I've, I've had more, uh, heard more historians grinding their teeth about the uh, enormous sales uh, than uh, I have by any other author this year which is always a good uh, sign of uh, who, who people are most envious of. <laughs> um, but it is an extremely good thing for history when a very serious an ambitious uh, and scholarly book sits for a long time on number one, uh, ahead of the celebrity biographies the, uh, uh, and all the rubbish uh, that normally uh, fills the first uh, 20 places in the bestseller list. And it hasn't happened for a while. Um, and as publishers always try and uh, publish the same thing over and over again once it's a success, I think we can look forward to lots of uh, uh, opportunities now for uh, young historians uh, uh, being uh, given a break, thanks to Peter. I talked this morning um, about my great hero, Sir Stephen Runciman, and, and how he, how he uh, based his prose style on, uh, he claimed, on Beatrix Potter. Um, but Peter is in many ways the, the real heir of Runciman. We are, I think, within about 50 miles of uh, Runciman's tower house in Dumfriesshire here. Uh, so he's an appropriate uh, guru figure. Um, what distinguished Runciman, particularly in the 1960s and 70s when he was writing. Uh, this was a time when serious history was dominated by um, the Annal School in France, people like uh, Brodel uh, uh, concentrating on systems and, uh, 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 and economics uh, and uh, the, the, the big wheels of history working in the backgrounds. While all this was going on, Runciman was writing old-fashioned narrative history books with enormous ambition and sweep. He was able to read almost every European language as well as exotica like Armenian, Turkish, Arabic, and Persian. Um, and he would sit in his tower house with all the sources around him on the floor uh, and construct these books that read, certainly to me as a 17 and 18 year old, um, as exciting as any novel. Um, these heroic figures like Beaumont and Tancred striding forth in, in chain mail to conquer uh, Sicily and, uh, and Antioch. Uh, and he sketched these characters in wonderful prose. Um, he uh, gave them blood and flesh and foibles and, and built them up as human beings and placed them in the great sweep uh, of history. And he wrote... Um, that he believed that the historian's job was to record in one sweeping sequence the greater events and movements that have swayed the destinies of mankind. And this was a very deliberate dig at his colleagues in academia, who at that point were concentrating on smaller and smaller, uh, eas more easily defended PhD fortresses about the, uh, uh, the, the, the cockle trade in Bambra, 1781 to 1782, uh, and, and so on. And, uh, and, uh, and Runciman in every way was the, was the kind of polar opposite uh, of this tendency. And for very good reasons, historians, particularly academic historians, do not do the big sweep because it opens them up to vulnerabilities. They have to write about periods they don't know much about, places they may never have been. Uh, and... Uh, very few dare to do it because they're colleagues sniping and, and, and cruel reviewers. Uh, and a book like Peter's, which embraces half of human history um, and does so in parts of the world with languages that are not easily learned uh, um, and specialisms uh, which are hard to come by, uh, is still extremely rare. Not as rare as it was in the 50s and 60s, but uh, uh, a thing that few men would dare take on. So um, tell me, I mean, you... You started off, in a sense, um, with, a more, with manageable subjects, the, the Crusades, Anna Kamina, uh, and uh, this wonderful Byzantine chronicler of the First Crusade, the daughter of the Emperor Alexius Kaminas. Um, and, um, but suddenly this book is a completely different scale to, to, to what you were doing before. Well, I think my, the sort of gestation, I mean, it's an interesting one. All, all authors, it's a very, 
odd thing to hear, to talk about one's own book because you, you write things and you know I do who's going to read them and so on. But I th and so I've been asked before when did when did you start writing this book and. There are lots of sort of smart, smart answers. Normally it's after I'd just finished the last one. But I think that I, the, the origins of this one began when I was about 15, I think, because I used to be taken off every summer to um, central Sweden into the middle of the woods where no one can hear you scream. And I, like my children, didn't have access to Wi-Fi. And uh, I had lots of brothers and sisters. Uh, and Sweden, although sometimes it's sunny, often it's really not. And, and my grandfather had a... Uh, was a was a was a real literary scholar and had a bookcase full of Russian novels, and I fell in love with Russian literature when I was about fifteen. Turgenev particularly, and I came back um, to my school and I was lucky. I was at a school where you could learn Russian for O level, so I did Russian O level, and I think even at that point realised that there was a whole canon of literature, a whole canon of historical events that I wasn't being taught about. I wasn't. But, you know, I knew the Russian Revolution had happened, um, but I, w I wasn't. I had learned nothing at school about the emancipation of serfs. Or, uh, I had learned nothing about the importance of Russia as a bridge between East and West. And I was very lucky that the, the teacher I ha who taught me Russian uh, was the kind of teacher who would not be allowed to teach in schools today. He had a terrible alcohol problem. Uh, he was extremely. Um, he was an extremely poor teacher. Uh, he didn't want to test us on our vocab and our grammar. He thought that we were either clever enough or stupid enough either way to, f to fall between those two stools, uh, either way those who deserve would deserve to. But he allowed us, he sort of set us alight. You know, that's what he did. And that's what young children need. They need someone or something. That can be an experience. That can be a, a journey. That can be a question. That, that can be a throwaway comment that somebody says at a dinner party with their parents or talking to friends that just makes them sit up. And... Um, and he lit that fire, I think, and let us get on with it. Uh, he turned up to our first R Russian lesson a quarter of an hour late, I suspect half cut, uh, and sat us down and said, right, I'm going to now teach you how to learn Russian. We all had a vocab book in front of us that he put there, or threw at us, I think. And then he said, I'm going, to, I'm going to now start singing the songs of the Russian peasantry. That's how you learn Russian. Uh, and he came back the next lesson, did the same thing, came back the next lesson, did the same thing. And we had a kind of scrum, eventually. Luckily, people who did Russian tended to be at the more able end of the, sca uh, the spectrum. And we, th we all looked at each other, so we're all going to fail our exams if we don't take this seriously. But we, were all, we all became passionate. I, be I became passionate about it. And even by the time, I mean, as, as luck would have it, and it is coincidence and fluke, uh, my school sent him off to Baghdad in my lower sixth year to dry him out. And he came back in my last year, said, I'll teach any of you boys Arabic A-level in a year <laughs> who are interested. And so by the time I was already 18, I knew that there was a world that didn't feature on my maps, didn't feature on anything I was taught about at school, bore no relation at all to that relentless story of the Tudors and the Battle of Hastings, uh, and, ev and even, even the Crusades, where you know, it's only so many times you could be told that violence committed by men who act on their beliefs, and then you switch on the news and it's PLO, or today ISIS, and you realize that, that it's more complicated than we can commit acts of violence that are good, and other people's acts of violence are bad when they act in for their beliefs. And so I was set, set up very early. I, said, I suspect you probably must have been, really. I know your travel books and so on, of, of discovering a world that didn't, was dripping with riches. And the two interesting questions were, how do you, what do you explore amongst this treasure trove that no one is bothering to look at? And then second, why does nobody go into that? That treasure, that, that room full of treasure, and and in fact, it's it's exactly you couldn't. I mean, it's perfect. It's as though we rehearsed it, which we we didn't. When I arrived in Oxford to do my PhD, um, I'm a Cambridge historian like Willie, and there's an interesting question. So many of today's really interesting historians are Cambridge educated rather than Oxford educated. Uh, in fact, when I sat down uh, with my my fellow historians who'd arrived, one of them said, "I asked what did, what are you working on?" He said, "I'm working on uh, horse husbandry in Lincolnshire, 1751 to 1759." <laughs> And uh, I've been very fortunate at Cambridge. Cambridge is very generous to me. It introduced me to my, my, now my wife. And uh, she is my sort of, we were very committed early co college sweethearts, had come down to Oxford, you know, more or less to drop me off. And I have never gripped her hand so tightly as she tried to, as she left and went back to London <laughs> to think I'm now stuck because I wanted to understand why the Byzantine world, why the Russian world, why the Islamic world, the Persian world, why they had been cut out of history and how one could look at events that were familiar to us from a different perspective. And uh, that, that, that series of coincidences, I think, was, was, was very fortunate. If I'd had my epiphany 
at the same time, age 15, by being in Lincolnshire for a wet summer and seeing horses, uh, you know, I, I'd have been a different, different person. And, you know, m maybe in the counterfactual history, maybe I'd have said something deeply exciting that would all have filled a tent in Traquair and, so, you know, and, and made myself unpopular with my fellow historians. But that, the point you make, I think, really is right. Uh, what, why, if you're an academic historian, you know, we, we, we tend to see the business world and academia as unrelated in any shape or form, but why take any risk? You know, why, if, if you can chisel out small pieces of high-grade research, why, why put yourself in the public domain? And that, there's an interesting question there. But, I mean, I actually... And is there a sense that some of your colleagues are disapproving of what you've done? Do you feel something slightly snotty at uh, the high table? That well, let's do it, let's put it this very way. very good, Frank Capabli. He's a bit of a popularizer. Or uh, well, it's, it, it, so I'll, t I'll tell you, there's no, you know, maybe some of my colleagues are even here. I have not had a single comment from... from uh, I've had w one member of my faculty has commented on my book. That's it. Uh, and that's, that was well, that in itself is significant, isn't it? Uh, it was, and that was that was to say, and that was to say. Um, I'm not going to say who it is, but I, I'm going to give it away much too easily. Uh, but ha well, he said to me, we sat at lunch in All Souls, which tells you that narrows it down a little bit. And he said, "I hear you've written a bestseller." <laughs> and uh, and I said, and I said, D have you? I said, have uh, have you read it? Um, and he said, no, but I get off at Oxford train station every day opposite a 12 meter by eight meter <laughs> poster of it. Uh, and that's all. I've had a member of the classics faculty, Averill Cameron, who, who you know, really, um, who has been incredibly generous. Who's a Byzantinist. Who's a Byzantinist. And not only admitted that she's read it and said that she thinks it was, it was terrific, but also that it's important that we in the academy, in the academy, this nosebleed area where, you know, nobody can name an uh, Oxford or Cambridge historian at the moment. You know, I mean, that's, I said, that's, a, that's a fact. It's a terrible for the general public. We are disconnected uh, from the real world. And that wasn't the world of the 50s and 60s where A.G.B. Taylor would have two hours on the BBC in prime time talking about the, uh, the Aust collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it's a very, it's a very um, difficult balance, the idea of what is popular history and what is academic history? Because I, I don't think there's a difference. I mean, I, I honestly don't think there's a Going back to Runcim again, he mourned, he said, uh, why is it that in the 18th century people were queuing up uh, for Gibbon uh, and people were waiting for the new, the new chapter of Gibbon to be published? I didn't realize it was serialized like, in the way that Dickens was. It was hugely popular. Uh, and, 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 well, I mean, interesting, Runciman yeah. said about Brodel, he said, um, he was asked, what did he think of it? And he said, I read three pages, thought it was so boring, I put it down, never read it. <laughs> I mean, utterly dismissive. And Runciman was sort of, was viewed, I mean, he was incredibly precocious as a, as a, as a boy. Um, you know, he used to write letters back home, apologizing at the end, saying, I'm sorry I've used green-scented ink, but it's simply irresistible, <laughs> at age 11. Uh, uh, and, but he was the classic type. I mean, if I, I don't know why, I, I, I have no, I'm not worthy of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the generosity. I mean, in fact, Willie is very much in the exactly the same vein of someone whose prime quality, and, the, and as I, we get older, as I get older, I realize that the people I like to collect around me are very different, but they all have one lowest common denominator, which is they like to ask questions. And I, I'm bringing my children to teach them there's no such thing as a, as a bad question, only a bad answer. And what Runciman did and what, what, what Willie has done, and if I, you know, I try to do is to try to ask things that are very simple, which is why is it that you are tent full of people who've given up? I was, no one told me I should bring my sunglasses, by the way, <laughs> to, to uh, You know, Can anybody name me you know, a, a current Chinese fiction writer? Or, or can you name me even one Chinese emperor from history? Put your hand up if you can name me a single Chinese emperor from history. One. <laughs> <laughs> Two. Okay. So, there, one, but but we are we are disengaged yeah. from the history yeah. of a significant part of the world's population, and and it doesn't. I mean, there are two things. One is why is that, and also what is the what is the history of the world that we keep reading about that we're globalized and so on. What does it mean about history in it, on, on its own? And in your in this massive book, the Silk Road, you you put forward the theory that quite a lot of what we call Western civilization isn't Western at all, that it comes from this area that we now think of distant and exotic, places like Merv, which you might visit on a, on a fancy holiday um, because it's in the middle of nowhere, but then was the center of the world. Yeah, well, Merv, you know, does anybody know which country Merv is in, even? 
Mervyn Turk, well, I, I'm sure you all know, I shouldn't do that. I would like with my students to scare them on the first week of term. Uh, Merv is in Turkmenistan, uh, which is not a particularly open country. You can't travel there easily, but Merv was called by Arab geographers and historians a thousand years ago as, as the mother of the world, the pearl of the globe, uh, because they knew the world was round, even though maybe other people didn't agree with that in, in Western Europe. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 but, but time changes, you know, there are winners in history. It's a sort of very trite, obvious thing. Everyone knows that winners write history, but the West is the most recent big winner of global history. But we are the latest in the line of holding sway. But there were many people before Great Britain uh, that, that had that kind of, maybe not quite such a, a, a wide reach that reached the Americas as well, but the spread of Islamic culture, the spread of China, the spread of the Indic languages and the Indic cultures has been profoundly important, but we have deprioritized them. I, I think, like I said about religious violence, it's a slightly inflammatory thing to say that when we commit acts of violence from an F-16, that's good, but other people's violence is bad. I think it's the same sort of idea we have about our, our common conceptions of what we are in the West, that goodness comes from us, human rights comes from the West, enlightenment comes from the West, but uh, you know, the Holocaust was committed by that same West. Uh, you know, you know the discrimination of color, race, religion, gender, sexuality. You know, we were the pioneers of, of intolerances. So it's quite, it's quite rich to now reinvent ourselves to say we are the promoters of human rights, given our track record. Um, but the, the, is, there, is there a thesis at the heart of this book? I mean, are, you, are you saying that this is, this is forgotten and this is interesting, or are you saying this is where it all actually happened and that, and that we are the, are the periphery? How far are you, are you in a sense, being um, revisionist, if you like? Well, I, revisionism is a sort of terrible, you yeah. know, I, I, what I understand by revisionism is someone who writes a book that says Henry VIII was actually a bad king but a good husband. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, and, and sort of deliberately tries to be provocative. And, and that's not a bad exercise, you know, how we learn, you know, the Socratic method is to try to constantly test arguments. And actually the, most, the worst arguments of all are the, are the sort of, you know, those the things that we think we know about and therefore are locked down. So, um, but I, th I think that there are probably two or three things as a thesis. One is that there is a history of a significant part of the world that has been overlooked. And what is that history? Second, how do we explain our other, you know, how do we explain global rhythms of change, of policy, of economy, and politics, the military, and so on, to explain the world that we're living in today? I suppose, you know, historians learn very quickly in their careers that they need to be very careful about shaking the dice and guessing what's going to happen next. Most people call that economics. <laughs> it's a cheap, cheap, cheap <laughs> shot. Good one. But it is a cheap, that is what happens. Every, every single bank will have a chief economist trying to predict what's going to happen next. You know, I think they should all have a chief historian who explains to them what has been happening, at least what, what the world looks like today. On a generous stipend. Oh, no, well, that would be, a, that would be f just fine, yeah. But, you know, I think, uh, but then I, so I think I that there is... The Goldman Sachs. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there is a sort of, uh, the, the, the trick question that I think Willie's trying to get me to say is, is the world changing? And can you read the tea leaves that allows you to see that we're moving into a new age that much more resembles the past? And, uh, you know, I'm happy to get cornered to a certain point on that. I mean, it seems to me that... Uh, you know, the Arab Spring, ISIS, these very unpleasant and, or well, the first a sort of great hope, lost hope, followed by this great unpleasantness of intolerances and so on. The rise of China and its, its creation of one belt, what it calls one belt, one road, offers of what seems to be free cash that's too good to be true in large parts of, of Asia. Uh, it looks to me that something more significant is happening. And it looks to me in, in that sense, whatever your personal views on Brexit, what's happening in Europe is really fiddling while Maybe Rome doesn't burn, but certainly change. You know, we're, we're seeing a world that is changing dramatically in front of our eyes. But because we're all focused on our own backyard, we're essentially uh, unable to even follow what's happening, let alone influence it. So I think that there is, it looks to me that, that Asia's rise is, and rebirth is in the process of happening. And I, I think that that's why my book has been so successful. I mean, lots of people buying it here in the UK to understand the problems. But the, the bit that surprised me most is that uh, in Iran and in India and Pakistan, China, and Russia even, this sense that their past is being pushed back up to where it belongs. And it's been very interesting to see both quite serious Muslim scholars, quite serious uh, people in India who have their own drums to bang, have kind of 
have really engaged with the idea that what history means uh, is up to up 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 for grabs, and 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 uh, and I think not the gratitude is the wrong word, but a sort of a respect. I think that there is a new way of trying to engage with not just the past of a particular country, but trying to put the piece of the jigsaw together. Would, when you're writing a book on horse husbandry in East Lincolnshire in the 1740s... Actually, it was the whole of Lincolnshire. The whole of Lincolnshire. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have a, a certain amount of data, and, and it fits into a book. You're telling half of human history. What were the... I mean, this is a question of method, uh, of, of gathering material for this enormous book that covers half the history of humanity. What, how did you... Did you just select on the basis of, like, a magpie choosing nice, dazzling things that, that shone out from the archive, or, or was there a... A, a methodology to what you, what you uh, chose. Well, the, the, it could easily have been well, swapped. You, you it could know, have been 3,000. Oh, yes, yes, and, yes, uh, yes. I was told that it shouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you know that too. The problem with the, the magpie approach is that normally those brilliant stories that are, you know, Emperor's been murdered in the bath and the exaggerated tales, are, you know, they're, they're the equivalent of headlines from the National Enquirer or from the Sun. You know, that they're great stories, but they're not actually necessarily close to what's going on. And the, the struggle any... Uh, seriously, or as any historian has, is how to judge, how to use their judgment to not use distorted sources that are telling a great story, but to try to do justice to the past. And I think that, you know, we historians take, can take ourselves a little bit, you know, quite seriously about our method and our approach, and also about the past, about its value. And it's, there's, hasn't, since my book came out, there's almost not been a day gone by where a fellow historian hasn't sort of, you know, been very anxious about why has their story not been picked up and written in the press and so on and so forth? And you can't really say anything. You know, it's all haphazard. I, I just assumed there was a machine that makes good books and pumps them out into the ether. In fact, I know lots of brilliant books that don't get any coverage and also lots of terrible books do, that yeah. sell hundreds of copies. When I wrote my book on the First Crusade, um, it was trailed in the Times. It got, I got a profile and I thought this is the beginning of something special. It said it's overturning a millennium of scholarship. And I said to Jerry, I don't know if he's here, that, uh, you know, that's what I want on my tombstone. You know, he, over he overturned a millennium of scholarship. That's about as good as life gets. And I was outsold by 25 to 1 by Binky Felstead from Made in Chelsea, How to Buy Shoes on the King's Road. <laughs> uh, you know, which was a cause of some anxiety. And then you realise that you know, it is, there's a reason for that. And there's a truth in whatever people need to hear or want to hear. And, um, but I think the approach was that I said about historians taking themselves seriously. You know, I, I think this is like, like you, Willie. I'm interested in lots of things that are not to do with history. I'm interested in music. I'm interested in sports. I'm interested in culture. I'm interested in literature. And Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley. Oh, no, so, uh, you know, I was a classical musician once upon a time. And uh, I think that history, you can, you can compare it to uh, writing a symphony. You know, there could be, like, very, in Amadeus, wonderful line, Herr Mozart, there are too many notes. <laughs> the emperor <laughs> says, things can be too long, and you, you can bore people. But you know, one of one of the things I thought about a few times when I was writing my book was um, when I was a boy growing up, the, the coolest football in the world was played by bear with me um, by the Dutch. The Dutch invented this idea of total football, where you didn't have a left back and a right wing and a centre. Everybody should be able to play in every position, and I think history can be like that too. You can you can get stuck with narrative sources, but we live in a generation where scientists are doing unbelievably exciting things in that that, ref, that, that impact the past. You know, so. Pollen counts, being, to, being able to look at ice cores in Greenland to tell us about volcanic activity, about, vo about uh, uh, release of, uh, for example, release of sulfuric uh, chemicals or compounds from smelting in ancient Rome and what, what happens in the 4th and 5th century AD. You can tell that in Europe... From a drilling of a Greenland... The, uh, yeah, you, you can uh, tell that industrial production stops at a specific point. And I think you can try to create a past that that brings all of these different things together, genetic materials. You know, I, I've worked with some, well, they did the work. I, I sort of read it okay. and uh, I talked to them in the pub a few times about it. They, 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 I've got some colleagues who work on um, latrines in Bristol and about parasites. You know, we as a human species, we evolve very, as you know, we all evolve very slowly. My children hope that might not be true, but the, we do evolve very slowly. Parasites, because they lay billions of eggs every day, evolve very quickly and you can tell from um, from, from deposits of fundament, how people's diets are changing and where, how people are traveling. And you can use that material uh, in counterpoint with all sorts of other materials too, to, to help detail the picture. And I think that what Silk Road does and, you know, is, is that, that, that 
you know, impressionist art, if you, if you stand a long way away, it looks beautiful, and then you get close and there's no, there's no detail there at all. I think the thing I'm proudest of is that when you have a passage or a paragraph or a section that you're particularly engaged in, the detail is all there and the footnotes are all there. That, that matters to me as an academic historian, partly because I know that it bulletproofs against criticism, that you do need to know what you're talking about. And it's very easy to throw out comments that are generally true, but actually aren't up to date. But it, it has to be absolutely on, on the dot. As, a, as an academic, you've concentrated on Byzantium, yeah. Russia, and, and 11th, 12th sort of century. Yeah. But this book sweeps vastly geographically and temporally in, in, in much further direction. What, what were the big surprises? What were the, what were the fun discoveries? I mean, did, did you suddenly discover that sort of second century Persia was something you really wish you'd spent half your life writing about? Or? I, I, I'm not sure. It felt to me like I had been um, released into a field. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a name like Peter. There are only so many. I don't know why. There are no, nobody famous in history is called Peter. Also, no one famous is born Great. on my birthday. <laughs> I read that in the Olympics, it turns out everybody who wins gold medals is born on the 23rd of March. Everybody. And I'm all on the 22nd. I think it's me and Andrew Lloyd Webber. And the 20th, oddly enough. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we're at least in the right month. The 23rd, I think, is Chris Hoy. It's Bradley Wick. It's all the cyclists, all the swim, everybody. Uh, and um, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, yes. Uh, what, what I, what I, what, so, yes, it was Peter, Peter and the Wolf. I used to, it was the first thing I learned in Russian, actually. And the first line of uh, Peter and the Wolf in Russian is, Pina Peter atkril kalitku i vushel na bolshiu zelioniu luzhaiku, which... For those of you who don't speak Russian, means uh, Boy Scout Peter opened the gate and strode out into the big green meadow. And that's what this felt like, not being trapped by the fact that I was a Byzantine historian or interested in Islam or whatever, but I could wander wherever I wanted. That was the most thrilling thing I've ever done, and that's the greatest privilege I had. That if I, if I, I, I had to go and find out about urbanization in 16th century Amsterdam, I had to go and work out, you know, we all know the Black Death killed millions of people but to work through what is the economic impact. And it really surprised me. For example, in the Black Death, it suddenly meant that the population of Europe and of, and of the Middle East were particularly bad uh, impact of plague. Suddenly, the population became much healthier because anybody who was infirm, ill, predisposed towards whatever, they died. all died very quickly. So suddenly, there was a much healthier population, so life expectancies shot up. Also, because people's families have been so traumatized, people's attitude towards money changed, and that would be quite useful in our current economic crisis. <laughs> why, why, spend, why save money if you've experienced th two-thirds of your family dying? And so that idea that we should live for today, a bit like at the end of the First World War uh, in the 1920s, that trauma of seeing a generation wiped out and family members dying created a sort of uh, feel-good factor, which then also caused comes to an end and you know I think every which way you look there are these sort of different you know one of the things I thought I had, I'd never really thought through was trying to track through the spread of Christianity eastwards because Christianity is a is an Asian religion I mean, we, we forget because you've got the we have the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Pope we think it's somehow something to do with Europe uh, but it's an Asian religion it's born from Judaism it's a fulfillment of Judaic prophecies if you're that way inclined you make the point in the book that there was a cathedral in Kashgar before there was one in Canterbury that's right and, and, and in Merv and in Samarkand and all these all these Gunda Shapur all these slightly unpromising sounding cities <laughs> and, um, and and in fact went just at the point where it looked like Asia would become Christian the great hero of the Christian story in Europe is the Emperor Constantine uh, Emperor Constantine was the one who converted to or adopted Christianity, or depending with you, if you trust Eusebius, which I don't, he became tolerant of Christianity and worked out how to use it politically. Uh, what he did, having decided that Christianity was a good thing, ra largely, well, either because he saw a sign in the sky or because so many members of the Roman army had become Christian, and, and you have a choice at that point. You either persecute on a huge scale or you have to relax it and work out, is it quite a good thing maybe if your God-chosen ruler, maybe you can work with that. Uh, at that point, Constantine starts sending very aggressive letters to the Shah in Persia, which say, I now, having become Christian and, Christian and so on, and oversee my empire, now feel it's within my remit to protect the rights of Christians everywhere. A bit like Hitler did in 1938 in the Sudetenland. He said, well, if you're German, then you're one of mine, even if you're beyond my frontiers. And that unleashes a wave of gigantic persecution because suddenly any Christian in the Persian Empire is considered a potential fifth columnist and their sympathies, they know nothing about these letters coming from Constantine. And in a way, although Constantine helps make Europe Christian, he destroys and kills Christianity and throttles it in Asia. And these kind of 
slightly unusual byproducts are, are ones that you keep finding when you when you when you when you when you ask questions. Again, just talking about method for a little bit. I mean, do you, were you using card indexes? I mean, what was your sort of plan of campaign? You here you are. You're, you you know a lot about the eleventh and twelfth century. You know about Byzantium and Russia, but you're you've got to basically fill in the whole of the rest of the globe. You've got an awful lot of research. It's not to quite as bad. It's not quite as bad as you think. As as perhaps it's a real shame. But when you come study Byzantine studies at Oxford, you get you get you you sit down with your supervisor like me, and you and, and you I ask which bit between the year three hundred and fourteen fifty three are you interested in, and that's quite a big period. It doesn't sound a long time because. The past seems disengaged. Time doesn't work the same way. That's how we think of it. But that's one and a half, you know, one thousand one hundred years. Whereas other friends of mine, they say, do you want to do June or August on the Somme in nineteen sixteen? <laughs> and so, uh, so from the time I became adult, you know, when I became like when I became, when I got my fellowship twenty years ago, you, you're used to having to look at a, this big period, and you're used to having to work around the fringes and work out about Armenia and Russia and Persia. So it's, it's not entirely that I've gone from a sort of 50-year block to suddenly taking on 2,000 years. And in fact, when I, when I suggested my book in the first case, I wanted to do from 300 to about 1,600. And my editor, who, who really knows well and has worked with, Fish, Michael Fishwick, said, do you think maybe you should try and do the, the last 400 years too? And, and I said, well, as it happened, I was an Arab, you know, well, I was a Russianist, really. I read Russian at Cambridge. And, and done some and done and new Arabic and I, I said, well, I'll go and read for a couple of years and if I think I've got anything interesting to say, then I, you know, I'll say it. But I, there's no point. No one wants anyone sitting on a stage or in a book telling them stuff they already know. And I think it was that that was that that was where the real reflection came was having to join up the dots in the later period. But you know, I I loved it. You know, I, I very nearly when I went to do my PhD, very nearly wanted to work on Russia in the 1920s and 30s. And it was a sort of bit of a toss-up whether I went backwards in time. And, you know, it was one of those discussions late night with my, with my wife and with my, you know, and, and she said, look, you seem to be really excited about Vikings and early Islam and Syriac and all these kind of weird things. And why should, well, you know, maybe you should follow that instinct. So I have lots of de debts along the way that I, I do, that I'm very grateful for. And, you know, you, I think you le learn as a historian, to be hu humble enough to, re to realise who's opened some of those doors for you. So no, no card index. What I do, my secret trick, is that I like to work from about 10.30 at night until 3 or 4 in the morning. Really? Yeah. Very unusual. Phone doesn't ring, no emails come in, and I feel tortured. Uh, <laughs> you know, I saw, do you I, not I, drink? I, I'm not, do you drink? I, do, I do normally have a drink. I do normally have a, a glass or bottle of wine. And in fact, I do, the quality... <laughs> Uh, I mean, it is, it is interesting. Oh, every, every artist I know, visual artist I know, and in fact, that was said also by Amadeus, to be brilliant, you do need to be tortured. And no one can see you as a writer <laughs> being tortured, apart from when you've written your book, and then, then you, either have, you either can pull it off or you can't. But it is a, you know, it's, a tor it's, a, it's hell writing a book. It's hell wondering whether you can actually do it justice. It's hell thinking you're going down a blind alley. Uh, there are endless topics that you open up and then they don't fit or you've got it wrong. An idea you have, you chase and disappears and there's nothing in it. And then it's even worse as you get towards the end of it, you think maybe I could just spend the next 20 years polishing it rather than... And how many years was this project? It's a massive book. Massive. I mean, the early Islamic stuff I started 20 years ago, the Russian stuff on the 20th century, that all has germs in the, you know, as an undergraduate... So years and years, but my, my secret trick is but apart from the idea. I mean, really working to write this book. I never, ideas? never thought I'd write a book no. like this. No. Never thought, never thought anyone would be stupid enough. I never thought, and and th that was a, It was a very interesting question: what we should call it, or and uh, what we should call it, because it's not just my decision. It's also you're guided by people who work in the book trade, who are you know their job is to then sell what you've done. And I said, you know, I obviously came up with Silk Roads, and and I thought it should have something. It, it needs to say something more than that, because most people who probably here today, think are you going to talk about Samarkand and how beautiful the, the great mosque is there in sunlight and the blue tiles shimmering and, you know, so on, and how Genghis Khan means so much to me. Uh, at Silk Road, <laughs> it, it tells us something that's peripheral. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't place it as being essential. And, uh, and I did, and so it was a real strike. And again, that's something I talked a lot about with, particularly with my wife and with friends of mine, to say, would a history of the world overpromise? And I've had one slightly relentlessly annoying academic game, but you don't really mention Australia, and how can it really be the world? And <laughs> you say, but it's not a history of everything. It's a history of how, what has mattered, you know, what, what, what a child growing up in Delhi or Shanghai or 
London or Rio should know about. And, and it's quite a provocative thing to do. But, you know, I deliberately don't mention 1066. I, I, I deliberately don't mention... I, I mention the French Revolution in passing. There are lots of... The Battle of Waterloo isn't in there. Because in the grand scheme but of really things... really difficult, presumably, at 2.30 in the morning after half a bottle of wine, to decide whether... It's very easy to toss it off now and say, I'm just not going to mention the French Revolution. I think but you can't... Must have I, think you can't about that I, I think you can't write... Uh, it's a sweeping statement. I never thought I've never said it before, so I'm probably wrong. I don't think you can write. I don't think one can write a book that other people enjoy reading if you're not if the author isn't in love with it. And I think that this process, I, I felt I felt in love with every single page, detail, or whatever. Uh, it's tiring. It's exhausting. You wonder why you put your head on the block. You're terrified that you're going to be judged for it. But I have a special. I have a series of different hats from Kazakhstan from. Central, uh, Central Asia from Istanbul that I quite often will put on at two in the morning <laughs> and my eyelids are drooping and I think what that, why in God's name I, do I, can, why would anybody think this was a good idea but you know you realise that, you, that what's the worst that can happen is that people say you're asking a bad question and you're answering it badly and you know life's too short to worry about what other people think but I, I never thought I would do a project that was as big as this, and I'm incredibly grateful that reviewers of, which, of whom you're one were, have been generous enough. To, that is a line from Braudel that, at the beginning of his book on the Mediterranean. It says, you know, a job of a historian is to be ambitious. You know, that is your job. And if you, finish your, if you finish writing a book and don't feel that you have said something new, interesting, and important, it doesn't matter what your readers think. It's that, have you done justice to it? And let no one, above all, Braudel says, let no one, uh, let them criticize me about whatever they like, but let no one criticize my ambition. And I quoted that in my my introduction, and my editor said, "Just get rid of it. Just <laughs> chop it out. Chop it out. Because they're gonna if they if they want to if that's what they want to get you we attack you for then or go for then, then fine. But I think I've been very lucky that that these different sweet spots of being able to do the Arab world and the Byzantine world, Western Europe, the Scandinavians, and Russia. Um, not you know you need to learn a lot of languages to do that. Two. We're running out of time. Um, but just I two. told you we should do two hours. <laughs> I said two hours. Uh, we, we just, uh, <laughs> have to ask who's coming on next. But um, two of my favourite stories, just for assuming that no one has read the book and, yes. and no one knows anything about it. Two minutes on the Khazars. On the Khazars. Well, the Khazars are great. Okay, so I love nomads. Is anybody here? Well, you love nomads in Scotland because you, um, you honour the sheep's bladder as your nomadic <laughs> cousins do in, in Bulgaria and, the, and in the steppes. Uh, so there must be some affinity there. But, you know, nomadic life is, is tough. But what tends to happen in Central Asia um, is the great nomad tribes normally, um, well, I, I, I'm sure like the, I mean, I don't want to be trite and please don't criticize. I don't talk about Scotland really at all. Um, and I have no real expertise and so on and so forth. But it seems to me that the clan structure is, is one that lends itself quite well to the nomad world, where sometimes clans can hate each other and kill each other. Or next door neighbors can hate and kill each other. Uh, and sometimes they can get on surprisingly well. What tends to happen in Central Asia is these great tribes who tend their flocks, normally under pressure of climate change or climate events, uh, find some reason to consolidate. And two or three of those you'll know about. You'll, you'll know about the Mongols. Uh, you'll have heard about the Huns. Both greatly underrated, the badge as being ultra-violent rather than supremely sophisticated, well-ordered, well-structured. That is all in the book. Ottomans, likewise, the Turks, likewise. Uh, but the Khazars are the kind of the, well, the, well, just quick, the quick, Eurovision winners. We're on time. Quickly go into, into uh, Huns, because they're too good. Uh, Huns and cranial deformation. That was a good oh. bit. Uh, <laughs> so, well, all of you, you've all heard of Attila the Hun, right? So the Huns were very keen to look different to, uh, to other people because they realized, they figured, number one, it made them look scary. And as long as you could um, brand your, 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 so if you look like you're some outer space, people tend to pay up quicker. Because they're terrified, they're terrified of you. That's that's the secret also of, of growing a big bushy beard and and you know making your children commit these acts of profound violence. Spreading fear is an incredibly effective way of getting people to take you seriously. I mean, I, I don't say that lightly. And so the Huns bound up the heads of their of their children as soon as they were born very tightly, so that their heads were sort of almost conically shaped from the sources. And in fact, the archaeological evidence shows that too. And the Huns, you know, they were supposedly they were supposedly scar the the faces of their teenage children, and they spent so much time on their horses that one of the great historians of late antiquity, Marcellus Marcellinus, uh, Amianus, um, describes them as looking like the, the pillar on which a particularly ugly staircase would be built because they were so <laughs> deformed. And they would eat a bit like the French by putting, by, they didn't like their meat very well cooked, like the French, 
And so they would put it between their thighs as they rode off, and then th that would be cooked by the time they got to the end of their <laughs> right. But anyway, the Khazars were the latest in this in this of a consolidation period on, in Central Asia, in about the in about the ninth century, and controlled an enormous empire that was hugely wealthy. There were big trade routes coming from Scandinavia, particularly of slaves. Uh, we don't talk about that very much because we call it the Dark Ages, and we prefer to think of the, the Vikings as being marauding rapists rather than the sort of progenitors of Björn Borg and Stefan Edberg, cool-headed, well-ordered, structured, whatever. That's, that's, that's all, I'm not saying it, there's a lot of research goes into this sort of stuff. Uh, but the Khazars realized that their great weak spot was that, you know, it's only so long you can have a great empire and worship the sun and be taken seriously. And so they sent envoys, the Kargan sends out envoys to the Christians, to the Jews, and to the Muslims to say, well, which, which um, religion should we adopt? We're open-minded, and we're sophisticated, and we're modern, and you know, we're, we're dominant, and we don't have any problem about being Khazars and having a sort of religion, particularly if there's God involved in protecting the leader. And uh, they ask exactly, the, the leader asks exactly the right question. He calls in the Christian, um, the, the, who's called St. Constantine. He's the inventor of the Cyrillic alphabet. He lives on today. And he says, well, should I choose Islam or Judaism? And Constantine says, well, well, whatever you do, you mustn't become a Muslim because they're all barking mad. Then he calls in the Muslim imam and says the same question. And the imam says, well, you know, the Jews have their problems, but the Christians are all absolutely wrong, but crazy. And he doesn't even bother to call in the Jewish rabbi. He says, well, it seems by default that Judaism must be the right choice for us. And there's probably something in that. Actually, the, the answer is not some sm smarty pants X factor or Britain's got talent type question. It's to do with the fact that you don't want to adopt a dominant religion of your next door neighbor. Having a kind of middle position is quite a useful idea. And, and that's, that's, that has some re relevance in, in the modern world that I, I work in, that Willie lives in, that, that China's overbearing interest now across Asia needs some counterweight. And the West and Europe and the European Union are out of the game. We're not interested. We don't follow it. We don't offer anything back where there's a real scream for that. That's a side... side. But anyway, so the, the Kazakh Hagen, in order to become... Jewish says, look, I'm convinced what I need to do. And the rabbi whispers into his ear and says, well, circumcision. So he circumcises himself and then orders his slightly horrified elite to do the same thing. And, and there we go. And the Khazars, the news of this then reaches Spain, where there's an important Jewish community in Cordoba, where a rabbi says, is this true? And he sends letters off to the, the care of the steppes of Central Asia. <laughs> is this true? Are you what we've been reading about and learning about the, the lost tribe of Israel? And the fact there's an empire that's Judaic and you know, has all, it all sounds right. Uh, and uh, he gets a letter back saying, this is, this is, I wasn't personally involved, this is 100 years ago, but this is why we became Jews. And the world is filled with all of these wonderful stories if you go and look for them. And all it, just, it doesn't end happily, the, the whole story. The Khazar story ends. Uh, well, it doesn't end happily. You know, every empire has its moment. You know, every company, every corporation has its time. And their sway was replaced. In the same way, you know, you, you, you go to Venice. I said this the other day. If you go to Venice and you see these houses on a grand, the Grand Canal, and all of you will look at them and think, was the person who built this with either or and immensely rich and certifiably crazy. But Venice was once the financial center of the world. And I suspect, uh, I've warned already about the limitations of historians looking forward, I suspect one day people will walk around Notting Hill Gate and say, people spent 35 million pounds on this. Uh, because, you know, things change. And the Khazar moment had their time, the Byzantines had their time, the Ottomans had their time, uh, and the world changes. You can't stop it, you need to adapt to it. And one of the things that I'm particularly keen with, with my children, and Willie's incredibly, uh, uh, incredibly smart kids who cornered me in a taxi in Jaipur when we got stuck in a <laughs> two-hour traffic jam and just didn't stop the questions. <laughs> the, that the world that they're going to grow up in, the world that your children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, whatever it is, are going to grow up in, uh, it, it is wrong that they are failed by an education system that doesn't teach them about India, doesn't teach them about Pakistan, doesn't teach them about Iran and Persia, doesn't teach them about Russia, doesn't teach them about China, doesn't teach them about these grand rhythms in history that just because cricket and the bagpipes and Scottish castles have been a force for the good for the last 300 years doesn't mean that that's going to stay like that uh, forever. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Peter Frankfurt. <laughs> They're saying finish, but I think we've got time for one more question. One question at the front. <coughs> I think shout it out. Shout it out. A 
So, well, I've understood two. What about uncertainty? If I understood it right, one is the world is not, has, is, has always been an uncertain place. I think always she's worrying be. about you with your bottle of wine at four in the morning. How do you how do you get up the following morning? How do I do that? Well, I'm you know I've been very lucky. I've got four children who are, think I'm a complete idiot. And in fact, when I was in Jaipur earlier this year, I walked out of the. I was in. It was it was the sort of. That was the. I, I should have had a heart attack and died. Actually, it would have been perfect. <laughs> Colin Thuber introduced me. There were I don't know how many people on the front lawn. Many. And I walked out, and that's maybe more. And uh, they all applauded wildly, like, I, like you will do for our generous host when we finish. <laughs> and um, I stopped, and I said to them, look, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, I need to come back off the stage again with my iPhone on, because I live in a household where my, I've got teenage twin daughters who think I'm an idiot. Uh, I've got a son who thinks that I don't know anything at all. And then one who's still young enough to think that maybe I've got something useful to say. And I came back on, and I, and I was introduced again, and I videoed it. And I emailed them the clip and said, this is what other people think of your father. <laughs> and, and I didn't get a reply. So I, I, I emailed it again to them that evening. And I said, this is what I'm doing your father. And they said, yeah, no, we saw that. <laughs> And that was it. So you could be grounded by all sorts of things. And, you know, the, the rum dr humdrum of academic life. And, you know, and I, I, I am aware, I've been aware uh, for many, many years that um, the sun has, been, has, has shone on me for all sorts of reasons that I don't understand, of the languages, the fluke, the coincidences, the generosity of other people, uh, and so on. And there's not been a minute of this process since the book came out and it's sort of done as it has that I have not felt... Um, humbled, I've not felt grateful. You know, I've, I've never, never thought that it would happen, and I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly honoured that you know all, all I have is, is a laptop, hands, and a brain and eyes, and what I read and how I see the world. The fact that other people might want to hear what I think, uh, you know, I'm much more interested. When we sit outside and Willie said, "What do you want me to ask me? What would you like? What, what would you like? What should we talk about?" I said, "I'm much more interested to hear what he thinks about things." And I learnt very early that the best thing you can do, apart from asking questions, is, is to listen. So thank you for listening to me. Just let cut the back. Just one more. Just one more. One more. Any last question? Yeah, they did the sunglasses. <laughs> Outed as a. <laughs> uh, uh, no. No, but it has supported lots of my colleagues. And, um, you know, what I, do, what I do, like all uh, historians, like I said about listening, you know, the best thing about Oxford is every single day, not every, no, every, every single day, there are five or six lectures by the world's greatest scholars. And um, it supported their funding. At, at, at my university, one third of our budget in the humanities comes from the European Union. Uh, I know that the British government said it's going to replace that until 2020. After that point, I don't know. I think that as my sort of side swipe is that in the world that I specialize in, that broadly runs Venice eastwards, everybody's talking about cooperation. It doesn't work easily between Pakistan and India, that's for sure. But everyone is trying to find a way of playing down differences. And it seems to me that here in Europe, we are talking about how we should all be different and distinct. And as it so happens, that is one of the classic signs of a disintegration and, uh, and of, of cultural change, of political change.